while we think there's still some some downside risk, we think there the balance is that we have probably sold off uh, sufficiently in the near term here that we could see a very you know meaningful bounce. Um, even if the longer term picture for for treasury bonds we think is pretty pretty murky given the fiscal situation. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart, welcoming you back at the end of a week here with the team from New Harbor Financial, one of the endorsed financial advisory firms by Wealthion. We had a lot to talk about this week, both in terms of what the markets have been up to, as well as reacting to some of the recent excellent interviews that have appeared on this channel, uh, joined as usual by Mike Preston and John Lodra. Hi, guys. Um, why don't we jump right in? Um, I've been seeing a lot of you guys this week. We just recorded a few days ago the uh, the live Q&A uh, with all of our financial advisors. Uh, thanks for participating in that, guys. Uh, great discussion, folks. If you haven't seen that, uh, it's a great opportunity to see what you know a collection of different financial advisors think about the current environment we're in and how they're allocating capital. There's a lot of agreement amongst uh, our panoply of, of experts there, but there are also some important disagreements in how they see the world. And so if you didn't watch that Q&A, folks, highly recommend you do it and maybe consider participating in, in our next monthly live Q&A, you can actually ask your questions directly and have our team of experts answer them. Um, guys, so a lot going on here. We, we, we talked a lot about in the um, in the monthly Q&A about rising bond yields. Um, th there's suddenly been this narrative of, well, bond yields can't possibly go any higher uh, because the Fed's going to pivot, right? And then all of a sudden, everybody has sort of shifted to the other side of the boat. Oh my gosh, yields are high and they're going even higher. Uh, oh my God, who wants to be in a, in a long bond at this uh, time? Uh, bonds are a death trap. Uh, it's really funny to me how quickly that narrative just kind of sprung out of almost nowhere. Now, I mean, granted, yields have been going up, um, but there was just so much confidence in the market that the Fed was going to pivot and that interest rates were on their way back down. Now, all of a sudden, that set confidence seemed to be getting shattered here. Um, so we talked a lot about that in the, uh, the the monthly Q and A. Like I said, I do want to pull a few strings on that with you guys. The day we're talking here, yields are down a bit, uh, but we're still at four point two on the the ten year Treasury. Um, John, why don't we kick things off with you in terms of um, you know just what's your general reaction to this? Do you think the market's concerns here are valid? Um, you know, I just saw an article the other day, Bloomberg saying that the federal funds rate may need to go as high as six percent now. Um, so have you guys sort of is this causing you to lose any confidence in your U.S. Treasury trade? Because I know you guys are invested in long dated U.S. Treasuries. Um, or do you think this is you know a bit of a smokescreen, a bit of emotions running high and the bond trade is still intact? Yeah, I guess we need, we need to kind of uh, parse a couple of, of nuances as it relates to the interest rate market. And um, I think, unfortunately, a lot of times these get conflated by the news media and whatnot. When we talk about the Federal Reserve and, and what they are, are doing in terms of rate increases or pauses or possible pivots and, and, and decreases, that really only directly speaks to what's called the federal funds rate. And it's really just the short term benchmark rate that directly affects things like short-term treasury bills, um, some short-term money markets, things like that. Um, when we talk about longer-term treasury bonds, that is less directly um, impacted or, 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 or driven by what the Fed does with the federal funds rate. And one need only look at the, the massive yield curve inversion um, that has existed over the last year, uh, where longer-term rates uh, were lower than short-term rates, to see that that's, those two ends of the curve are not uh, directly linked to each other. And in fact, the Fed can't directly, uh, at least in, in the short-term interest rate markets, affect long-term rates. What is more affecting long-term rates are things like, well, certainly QE affected when they were actually buying long-term bonds. And, and now they're in the in the mode of selling down some of their, their massive uh, bond portfolio qu quantitative tightening. So that certainly can have a an impact on the longer end of the curve. And that's probably one factor among several that has, has uh, given some um, tailwinds to the rise in, in longer term bond yields. Um, and, and we've talked about other factors there, um, the uh, tweaking of the Japanese yield curve control. These are tectonic shifts between major economies and central banks kind of fighting each other, if you will, for, for currency um, you know, moves and, and uh, liquidity moves. Um, um, you know, the massive increase in issuance by the Treasury to fund the deficits. These are all things that have 
can can we we can point to proximate as the reason or, or catalyst for perhaps the recent uh, rise in in longer term rates. We think we're uh, getting towards the the, the kind of uh, extreme there in the short term, anyways, on, on those those longer term rates. Uh, as you pointed out uh, today, as we're talking, the ten year Treasury uh, bond is at about four point two percent. Yesterday it was closer to four point three, and it got uh, I think almost to four point four the day before that. So we've seen a, a little little coming off of long term yields over the last few days here. Um, but it's not unreasonable think, to think that um, those, even in the short term, that those longer term treasury bond uh, rates could go to, say, four and a half on the, the 10 year or maybe even five in an extreme. And, and that there's a lot of there are a lot of um, kind of competing factors here that, that drive that. But we think the more likely path over the near term here is even if we do move higher in, in yields uh, in, 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 you know, kind of uh, marginally towards four and a half or even five, we think, and we agree with um, many of the guests you've had, and I know you, you had an interview with uh, Daniel D. Martino Booth. Um, we think there's still very much a recessionary type um, phase in the cards. Um, seeing a lot of the data that that points to that, and um, even just looking at, um, I've got one chart maybe I can share here just to to kind of um, look at that if you can enable my screen sharing. Um, this chart here basically shows um, the spread between uh, ten-year and three-month treasuries, and so that's the that's the blue line. Basically, it's it's the ten-year rate minus the three three-month rate, and you can see anytime that that blue line goes below zero percent here, it means the curve is inverted, meaning the longer-term treasury rates are lower than the short-term rates, and it's not random coincidence that. Uh, if you look at all this throughout this history, this goes back to 1980 or so, every time there's been an inversion like that, and then subsequently a, um, a, a steepening of the curve, in, in other words, that the uh, inversion gets less inverted and, and in fact, um, at some point becomes uh, uninverted, that uh, without fail, within some fairly tight lag has ushered in not only recessions, which are, are uh, denoted here in the gray gray bars, but also some major tops in the stock market. And that's what this uh, orange line, this is the S&P 500 uh, plotted on a um, exponential or, or logarith logarithmic basis. Um, but basically you can see, boom, uh, peak here, um, right after this, uh, you know, this this is the, um, I'm sorry, right here, the, the COVID sell off, right after the curve inverted re recession, however brief that was, uh, right here, uh, right before the housing bust, we had a, a steepening and, and ultimately an uninversion. Big, big peak there in the market. Right here in the in the tech bubble, technically the the stock sell off uh, started before the, the the curve started to, to steepen. So that was more of a, a, a little bit of an advancement. But you know, we can go back through history and see that. So um, it really matters how the the curve steepens, though. What we've seen thus far is what market analysts might call a a a bear steepening where the steepening is happening because the longer end rates uh, are are rising relative to the short end rates Con contrast that with with a bull steepener where the, the curve steepens because the short term rates are being driven lower by the fed regardless this the steepening effect has has historically especially when valuations are as, as uh, uh, uh over inflated as they are and, and where the recessionary signals are are almost the almost seeming inevitable it's been a very bad time to to be um in the stock market but ultimately the bond market tends to to do very well in, in the short term so so we think the longer term treasury bonds are are, are very sound risk reward uh, there's, there's certainly risk and we have hedges on uh, in fact we've uh cut our position in half effectively um by by hedges um while we think there's still some some downside risk we think there the balance is that we have probably sold off uh, sufficiently in the near term here that we could see a very, you know, meaningful bounce. Um, even if the longer term picture for, for treasury bonds, we think is pretty, pretty murky given the fiscal situation. And, and, you know, basically the last 40 years, we had nothing but declining long-term interest rates. We think the next 10, 20 years aren't, aren't going to look anything like that. So it's going to be a much more challenging bond market. And just, I'll just find out, you know, make one final comment in, in, in kind of, Reference to that, I just saw a chart this morning showing um, globally the, the the recent rise in yields and almost um, most of the, the 
the dramatic rise in yields has been in developed markets economies like here in the U.S. and developed Europe. And uh, whereas uh, the the rise in interest rates in, in emerging market government bonds has been much more muted. And that speaks to perhaps that, you know, what was once considered very much healthier fiscal situations in developed markets really starting to look more shaky in, in some ways than even some developed markets. So a um, lot of kind of points there, but I guess I'll stop there and then we can probably launch off some some uh, topics there. Okay. Um, and I uh, just want to note on that chart, right, where you showed how the yield curve starts uninverting right before a recession. In fact, it's got a perfect track record in that data series you showed. That's folks. That, that's why people pay so much attention to these inverted yield curves is because they're just such a predictable uh, forecasting tool for recessions. And I want to share my screen here. Okay, so this article here, uh, it's on Yahoo Finance title, Professor Behind Recession Indicator with a Perfect Track Record says it remains way too early to call off a U.S. economic downturn. So um, this is citing the work of Duke professor and Canadian economist Campbell Harvey, uh, who's done a lot of work on the um, correlation between inverted yield curves and, and recessions. Um, so uh, basically what he says here is, the longer we go without a recession after the inversion, people start to doubt the indicator, which is fine, Harvey said. I characterize it as a lull before the storm. So, you know, this is a guy with a tremendous amount of expertise in this indicator that the world is, is, has been fixated on. As we've covered on this channel, John, several times, um, coming into this year, everybody was concerned about a recession happening in early 2023 for a whole bunch of reasons, but certainly the inverted yield curves was a big reason why. As the year has progressed and the stock market rallied um, and the recession didn't show up, you know, we saw the narrative go from, okay, well, maybe we're not going to have a hard landing. Maybe we're going to have a soft landing. And then in the past couple of months, that's morphed into a, oh, we're probably going to have a no landing, right? Um, hey, that recession indicator probably doesn't matter anymore. And, you know, things are different this time. And uh, I think we dodged that bullet and it's sunny skies ahead, right? This is exactly what Harvey's talking about in this article here, which is when it takes a while, you know, it, it, it does take a while from when the, the, the curve inverts, uh, until the recession arrives. In fact, generally, it's the uninversion of the curve that is a, a more of a time signaling uh, mark that says, okay, the recession clock has now started. Um, so, you know, he says, look, you know, human nature being what it is, people get complacent and they start to think, you know, it's maybe not going to materialize. So he said, you know, this, this, hope for a, a, a no landing scenario is actually what we would expect from history because people just, they, they, they get tired of waiting and then hope creeps in and, you know, it's off to the races. And of course, as he says, that's the calm before the storm. Uh, and, and sadly, what people do during that time is they they jettison their concerns. They start piling back into the market. They start going further out their risk curve. And then when the recession arrives, you know, people have made themselves vulnerable uh, to the damage that the recession can cause to their portfolio. So that's one of the things that we're trying to keep people focused on by, by zeroing in on this data here. Um, so John, um, just a couple quick uh, questions for you on, on two things you said, and then Mike will come to you. Um, uh, the yield curve can uninvert in one of two ways. So you, you basically said, look, uh, it, the Fed really only controls the short end of the yield curve, right? With the Fed funds rate. So, you know, it, it's, it's only the instruments that are, you know, maybe a year out or whatever, where it can really influence uh, yields for, for bills that are that short, the further you go out, it's really the bond market that is setting the yields. And the bond market doesn't always agree with what the Fed uh, thinks yield should be. And of course, not, an inverted yield curve is a great example of that. Now, the markets, I think, have been expecting the yield curve is going to invert or uninvert by the Fed pivoting and bringing short-term yields down. That's one way that it can uninvert. The other way is that the bond market can say, uh, you know, you know what, we, we're we changing our mind. We don't think the Fed's necessarily going to pivot. We think there's more risk in the system now, and we're going to start raising yields on the long end. And that's kind of what's been happening of late, which is why I think people are beginning to panic. You would have two pretty different outcomes depending upon the way 
that that these curves uninvert, right? I mean, if 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 it if it uninverts because the Fed is bringing rates back down again, um, then we would expect kind of the common playbook of long dated bonds to increase in price. Probably all asset prices eventually would catch a bid after some period of time. If instead the Fed were to keep rates high and the bond market would go up to meet it, that's actually a pretty painful world that we don't have a lot of lived experience in. Is that correct? Yeah, it is. And that's that's why it's called a bear steepening when that, when that dynamic happens. The the long end does the 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 steepening, not the not the short end coming off. And and that's why it's been painful for bonds uh, in this in this recent rise in interest rates. That bonds have sold off pretty pretty healthily, as as we've right. talked about. And, and, what, and so, what, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but it's not just going to be painful for bonds. No. Should that indeed be the case, well, that, that higher cost of capital bleeds into everything and ends up being painful for everyone. Correct? Yeah. In fact, I mean that's one of the big you know um, kind of dilemmas or, or bafflements that we have is is how unaffected the stock market has been by this. Um, because basically, when you think about for example, tech stocks, which have been the lion's share of the gains in, in this market, uh, especially ones that don't pay dividends and maybe their prices are, are being justified by future earnings, not, not present earnings, you know, growth, you know, based to the future. Um, in effect, those are like really, really long duration bonds. Um, you can think about duration in the stock market as well. And those kinds of techie growth stocks that are being valued on some pie in the sky, big, big earnings off in the sunset, um, they should be getting hammered by these higher rates. Um, but I guess it just takes a, a story about AI and, and you know, rainbows and beliefs to, to basically, at least in the short term, counter that. And yeah, everyone's drunk at AI. Reports this term. week, you know, we're talking today on the day that I guess um, NVIDIA reports. So that that's uh, obviously a, a headline stock that has has been <laughs> really uh, puzzling for a lot of, a lot of people in terms of the valuations that it's uh, still commanding. Okay. Um, all right. And then one other thing you, you you quickly mentioned was the impact of Japan's uh, yield control, yield curve control efforts here and how that's impacting uh, rates here in the U.S. Or, or yields here in the U.S. C can you just explain how for the folks that aren't aware of, of the mechanism for how what Japan does impacts U.S. yields? Yeah, and this this also speaks to how the Fed, central banks in general, but but the Fed as well, could influence longer term yields, not through federal funds rate moves and and increases or drops, but their act of buying or selling of of bonds in the open market, uh, and that's in fact what QE was. They printed you know printed money out of thin air, trillions, and went out and bought with printed money these bonds. That's what drove the long term rates. The ten year yield got as low as 0.4 percent, I think, in in the the heat of the COVID sell off. Some of that, of course, was panic uh, buying, not not necessarily the Fed. But um, now that the Fed is is um, selling off some of its assets, it's actually having a um, you know kind of a tight. So even if the Fed pivoted and started lowering short term rates at some point, and they simultaneously kept on selling off um, longer term bonds from their portfolio, those those two p policies in parallel could could be moving the needle in opposite directions by at different ends of the curve. So it's a very and, and what Japan is doing, they basically said that their long their policy had been up until about a month ago that we're gonna we're gonna go in and defend or, or buy um, Japanese government bonds to keep the yield on those bonds uh, at no more than a half a percent, fifty basis points. Uh, they came out and about, again about a month month ago said, you know what, we're gonna we're gonna have some flexibility. We're gonna let that. You know, they didn't say we're gonna we're gonna necessarily let it go as high as one percent but they they will have the discretion to do so so right off the bat um a japanese bond yielding 50 basis points higher on a relative basis is gonna take some demand away from from u.s treasuries right relative to if if the yield was capped at, at half a percent so it's all about the comparative yields and the moves in the currencies so on a, on a you know uh you know, kind of all things, uh, all else being equal basis, a rise in a, a, a foreign government's, um, like Japan's government bonds, and the yields in those is going to be incrementally more attractive than the, the status quo had been, right, relative to U.S. treasuries. Got it. Okay. So basically, Japan just made the deal a bit sweeter on um, JGBs. And so therefore, some of the money that otherwise might go to buy treasuries is is migrating over to Japan instead. Exactly. And there's all complications with carry, you know, it's a very interconnected system. It's not quite, you know, you know, one-to-one -one kind of mechanisms here. They're very, very complex. 
Okay. All right. So Mike, uh, thanks for being patient coming over to you now. So um, we had a conversation um, just recently on the channel with Danielle DiMartino Booth, who, you know, basically her outlook was, I think the term she used was perfect storm, <laughs> was that, you know, we're going to see a lot of shoes dropping in the second half of, of 23 here and maybe bleeding into the first half of 24 that she thinks makes a recession sort of, you know, almost unavoidable. Um, and I, I want to get into that territory with you in a second. Um, I, I just want to sort of make the bridge from what I've been talking about with John to that conversation with, um, I interviewed Luke Groman. That interview hasn't hit yet. It's going to hit next week. Um, but Luke is actually, he's on team. I don't want to be in long-term long duration bonds. Um, and in his mind, he said, look, there's there's four destabilizing events that recently happened. One, the price of oil uh, has risen by 20% plus. Two, the Bank of Japan is has just changed the game a bit with the yield curve control and the way that John just described. Three, the US uh, credit rating got downgraded, which we've already talked about in previous videos. And then fourth, the U.S. Treasury has announced it's going to have to borrow almost $2 trillion in the second half of this year, which is going to dramatically increase the supply of U.S. Treasuries. And so he's basically saying, hey, these are all the reasons why uh, bond investors are now saying, well, I'm less excited to hold on to a long term uh, bond. And I want to be if I am, I want to be compensated with a higher yield for it. So. He believes that yields are going to keep going higher. Um, and then he's got a bunch of, of sort of macro reasons why he thinks over the next bunch of years, the pressure is going to be to keep yields going even higher still. So he's basically saying, I really don't want to be in these long term bonds. Don't have to say that you have to agree with him. But, um, you know, at least the factors that he just lifted off there are, are, are real facts. So um, as, as, as a hand of baton to you. Um, anything you want to say in addition to what John and I have said about, about the bond situation. And then I'd love to get your reaction to what Danielle had to forecast there. Yeah, a couple of comments. Um, you know, Luke points out some very uh, good points and all of these things are, are real facts, but many of them are going to have short lasting effects, not necessarily long lasting effects. There's a lot of different uh, things that could be positive for the bond market. Uh, particularly the long-term bond market. And I should I should probably pause and say that we don't want to be in long-term bonds for a long period of time either. I think that um, the, the bond yields are likely to go higher in the long run. It's really the the now uh, to two years from now that we're most interested in, in bonds. Bonds have had a wicked sell-off. Um, and, and a lot of the reasons that you talked about are, are the reasons why. But in our opinion, the... You know, the current prices of bonds, if you look at TLT, for instance, has lost nearly half its value in the last year, more than account for all of these factors. And there's a lot of different things that can happen to bonds that that could be good. The the uninversion of the yield curve could happen in such a way that the 10 year goes from from four point two to three. And, you know, the short end goes back down to one. I, I think that we're taking it as a, as a given that short yields are going to stay at five point two percent forever. That's not very likely. Um, an uninversion of the yield curve can happen, and it can happen in such a way that long bonds actually benefit. Now, also, a, a big drop in the market or a uh, you know economic crisis is, in our opinion, it's going to cause money to flow into the long end to try to nail down those long-term rates. And so, you know, the, the sell-off in bonds has been pretty drastic, and we think really overdone. It doesn't mean it can't get worse, we, we presently have hedges in, like John just said, to make sure that our clients can can handle it if it gets worse. But we wouldn't be surprised to see you know, bonds rally sharply in the next year to two. You know, TLT, which is, you know, a proxy for the long bond market, it's having a nice day today. It's up around almost 95. It got as low as 92 in what I think is a second panic sell-off, uh, kind of an echo capitulation to what we saw last uh, last fall, last October, could could go back to 120 to 140 if we see rates come down in this yield curve uninvert. Certainly, it will help if the S and P gets a you know a long overdue sell off as well. So um, you know those are all the reasons we're in that trade, and you do get paid to wait nearly four percent at current prices, uh, current income. Uh, 
So, you know, there's a lot of talk about bonds, a lot of talk about interest rates. It seems to be the hot topic these days. That's usually when a turn, at least a short term <laughs> turn is at hand when everyone's focused on this. So um, that's probably, I think we probably said enough about bonds. I'll ta talk to what Danielle DiMartino Booth said for a moment. You guys have already covered a lot of it. She says this is the closest to recession that she thinks we've been since 2008, 2009. And this time, there's probably no zero interest rate policy to help. doesn't mean the Fed won't try. I mean, the Fed certainly will go back to quantitative easing if we have a big market crash or an economic contraction. The big question is, will it matter? You know, we talk to people all day long, and, and almost invariably, the question is, well, can't the Fed just do this forever? Won't they just return to zero interest rate policy? They'll probably try, but each of the times in the last 20 years, the markets have had big downturns. And the Fed has, uh, you know, cut rates and went to easing. The market tumbled anyway, and I think the worst thing that could happen, the scariest thing that could happen, is that we have a market tumble. The Fed pivots and reverts to, you know, printing money, quantitative easing, and after maybe a brief bounce in the market, the market continues to collapse anyway. That would be, I think, a, a real the emperor has no clothes moment, and that would be a really scary time. And that's in fact what I think is likely to happen. So. You know, we'll see. And, and you know, we do, we, we're we still in this period of time post-COVID where $7 trillion was released directly to consumers. They spent it all. They gambled on meme stocks. They bought options. You just did a, an interview with another gentleman. I'm sorry, I can't remember his name. But um, you talked a lot about the options market and how the retail trader got into the options market for the first time. Well, that still exists, but it's not going to last much longer. That was direct money into people's hands. We talk about fiscal stimulus this year, and you know the Fed borrowing or the Treasury borrowing another 1.9 trillion. That has maybe forestalled a recession, but it won't have the lasting effects of this direct to consumer money that Danielle talked about. And you know, just to wrap up with with the things she talked about, she, she talked you you and she talked a lot about the Paycheck Protection Program and how that put a lot of money into the into the economy and had a lot of abuse attached to it as well and then how the the ERC the employee retention credit continues to uh to put money directly into the highest income earners most of the money from those programs went to the top 20% in terms of income earners and wealth holders you know those people do buy a lot of luxury goods and spend a lot of money danielle points out how ERC is probably going to end, and that's going to have a negative impact on the economy and, and the markets. Uh, and also, by the way, right right around the same time that student loan repayments are going back into effect. Exactly, too. exactly. Um, and she points out that inflation's coming down is probably going to keep coming down. We agree with that. And lastly, she wraps up with some things that uh, she does like. She talked a little bit about treasuries being mildly positive, um, but. She really talked, well, she also talked about municipal bonds. Look, if treasuries rally, municipals will rally as well. So we can't disagree with that. But really, her, her biggest message was sit on the sidelines. Don't be afraid to sit on the sidelines. Take an 18-month vacation. We agree with that. Right. You know, we're, in, in, in not, not necessarily cash, but in cash and instruments like T-bills or money market funds where you're getting paid 5 plus percent to sit in safety. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the yield curve on the front end is very flat. Three month T-bills is 5.2, six month T-bills is 5.2. Two year treasury bonds are 5%. You know, with a good chunk of money. Yeah, get it. Particularly if you're overinvested, particularly if you're sitting in a 60-40, you know, never touch it portfolio. Take a chunk of that out. Get down to below 30% equities, for instance. Don't worry so much about selling the high quality long bonds that you have at present, because those are probably actually going to get a pretty good bounce, but particularly within the equity space, which is ridiculously overvalued still. You reduce that and take a chunk of that cash, put it in US treasuries up to two years, I'd say. Sit back and take a vacation. You know, don't sit in cash earning zero. You can you can get 5.2. And so we we presently have close to 40% cash equivalents. Uh, earning 5.2. We have 5% net stock exposure. If you don't count gold stocks, if you do, it's about 15%. Um, and so we're still we're still waiting. Frustratingly, 
for you know a bigger pullback to be able to take some more action. The last couple of weeks, the market's had a big bounce. We'll see what happens. We're back to some resistance points. This would be an obvious place for the market to turn over. Um, and you know we're looking at levels of about 4,200 on the S&P if that happens. Uh, and there's some big events, NVIDIA earnings. Everyone's watching NVIDIA. The tech stocks have been driving this market, uh, but we think the risk is lower. Okay. Um, so I, I took away from, from the Danielle discussion and from the discussion with the options fellow. His name is Imran Laka, by the way. Uh, he's an options, experienced options trader, uh, but spends most of his time now educating people about how to use options. And they said two things that I think put together are worth focusing on. Um, one, Danielle, I think, thinks about bonds, particularly treasury bonds, very similar to the way that you guys do. Uh, and so she thinks that, look, for this, this, all the reasons of her sort of perfect storm of economic depressors that are coming down the road, um, she thinks that the Fed, whether or not it has successfully tamed inflation by that time or not, is likely going to have to start cutting rates again. She doesn't know exactly when that's going to happen, but you know, six months, within the next 12 months, probably, I'm putting words in her mouth, but I, I think she would agree that that's probably the probability the window that she's looking at. And that you know, the Fed is going to have to take rescue efforts to try to rescue things that are breaking in the economy under these high rates while in, in, in recessions arriving. And therefore, that aggressive coming rate cut program is going to be pushing the prices of bonds higher. So, you know, she's basically highlighting two things. She's saying, look, you can position ahead of that in longer duration bonds and ride that appreciation if you want. But even if you don't, you know, you can just for the first time in a long time, Park in safety in those short term, short duration assets you just mentioned, Mike, and just get paid to wait to see how the movie plays out. And then you're liquid, right? So you can quickly deploy once the market opportunity becomes clear of really where capital should go, right? We haven't had, we haven't had like a high probability events like that in a long time as investors. So those were two opportunities, sort of relatively rare opportunities on the bond side. What Imran was telling us on the option side is the option market, it provides a fair amount of intelligence to the investor that watches it closely. And a number of times that intelligence can kind of be a leading indicator. And what he talked about is, is you'll see when people are getting bullish or bearish, they will be um, basically increasing or decreasing their level of protection using options. And usually you know, the more bullish people get, the more protection they buy just in case their bullish trade goes against them, right? And what he noticed was that as the markets were, you know, have been kind of drifting downwards over the past couple of weeks, he hasn't seen like a commensurate change in um, protection positioning, which leads him to believe that people aren't really freaking out here. So in other words, he's sort of saying, I'm not seeing the early indicators that I would expect to see prior to like a real big market rollover or downdraft, there just doesn't seem to be that much fear in the markets right now amongst these participants. So of course that can change on a dime, but you know what he's saying is, is looking at that key indicator, he thinks more than likely the downdraft that we've seen, or the, the, sorry, the, this relatively slow pull, uh, short pullback that we've seen in the markets in the short term is probably gonna be short lived. Things will start recovering again and, and start trying to power higher. Who knows what'll happen? We'll see. But I thought that was a really interesting indicator. But it, but a key thing that he mentioned is he said, um, downside protection insurance in the market right now is ridiculously cheap, right? This sort of the sense that there really is no fear and that if you want to buy some long-term insurance against your current portfolio, he said, it's, it's, it's not the cheapest it's ever been, but it's close to the cheapest it's ever been to buy puts on the S&P right now. And so again, if you're an investor who's just you know kind of worried by some of the macro issues that we've talked about here, that Danielle talked about this week, that Luke Groman's gonna talk about next week. Well, if you wanna buy some insurance using puts, pretty good time to do that. Now, I know you guys use puts a lot as hedges in your portfolios. I'm just curious, you know, John, do you have a, uh, are you guys taking advantage of this window right here where, where some of this insurance seems to be sort of historically cheap? 
Well, um, so let me first comment on, I, I didn't see the video that uh, the other other guests of yours have, but I, I certainly, Mike and I know the dynamics of the option markets pretty intimately. And a lot of the retail um, activity in options that, that you spoke of uh, is very speculative, um, typically buying very short dated uh, call options, you know, basically the equivalent of a lottery ticket, right? Um, and, and that's been a lot of the activity. Um, there are many ways to use options. The way we use options are, are truly as, as hedging or income producing instruments. So for example, simple strategies like covered call writing, where you sell call options against an underlying security and get paid a premium, which can be viewed as a, a special dividend or a downside buffer or whatever you want to call it. Um, buying put options, like you just talked about, are a way to kind of put a line in the sand insurance floor, if you will, on, on a particular holding. And you can combine uh, calls and put options. So, for example, we'll oftentimes use caller strategies to basically sell call options at a level that we frankly don't um, assign much uh, probability of, of, of whatever thing we're writing call options on going above that strike price. So we're, we're getting paid a premium for for uh, foregone upside that we don't think is likely there to begin with. And we use those premiums oftentimes to, to, to buy put options. Now, put options have gotten more sp expensive um, in, in recent uh, days and weeks because the VIX has has risen a bit. Uh, anytime you get a, a bit of a, a ripple in markets, you're going to get a little bit of an increase in the cost of insurance. But um, so the, we talked about the hedge, for example, that we have on um, our longer term bond position, about half our position. Uh, that involved a caller strategy where we sold call options. And, and bought put options. And those put options are now you know, deep in the money, which uh, basically has the effect of saying, hey, for that half that's hedged with those put options, where we are right now, there's almost no downside um, in, in that piece. It's effectively neutralized the downside risk. Um, sometimes it, it can make sense to, to buy put options outright. Um, just understand that when you're outlaying premium like that, it, it can add up pretty quickly on an annualized basis. So we, we, uh, we like to rather than outlay premium, we generally like to finance that premium or pay for it by taking in call option premium. And there's nothing speculative about the strategies we use. We use. They're, they're very much hedging strategies and uh, um, you know, not in and, of the, in and of themselves a speculative bet on a market moving one way or the other. Um, so yeah. Okay, well, sort of my coda on this is while we're in a time where in general insurance is still, you know, quite affordable on a historical basis. Um, if you think you might want to implement some of that in your portfolio, you know, as uh, options are a bit mathy, they're, they're certainly mathier than just, you know, buying a stock long or short. Um, if you don't have a lot of experience using them, I highly recommend you sit down with a financial advisor who's got a lot of experience using them. And again, not, not for necessarily speculative, um, you know, aggressive kind of gambling, but more sort of, you know, how do you use it as a, as, as a hedge in your portfolio? Um, if you're interested, sit down with your financial advisor or, or find a financial advisor who understands these products well and say, look, this is what I'd like to do. Can you, you know, basically construct a strategy for me that I can take advantage of these low insurance options while they're still there? Um, all right, guys, well, look, as we begin to get near the back half of this conversation, I want to, I want to, um, uh, share my screen one more time and get your reaction to this uh, article that I just saw this morning. Um, when this talks about um, the amount that uh, Americans have saved for retirement, um, or I should say maybe the scarily small amount that the average American has saved for retirement. So look at this. Uh, on average, Americans between ages of 50 and 59, so the cohort that's getting ready to retire, have around uh, 189,000 in their 401ks, right? Um, that's not a lot of money to finance, you know, the next 30 plus years of your life, right? Um, but, and we talk a lot about this, averages can be deceiving. You really want to look at the median. So they say most people have less than a third of that amount saved. The median 401k balance for Americans in their 50s is only $57,000. Um so, uh, and again, you know, the median is, is the 50th percentile. Um, so of everybody who's got money in a 401k, uh, the, the person right in the middle of that distribution is sitting there at 57,000. Um, so, you know, 57,000, I'm sorry, it's just not enough to finance 
a retirement from, you know, your mid sixties to your end of life. So, um, I love to just kind of get your guys' general reactions. Mike, I'll, co I'll come to you here, but you, you guys are talking with people day in, day out who are, you know, aspiring to make sure that they don't have to work until they die, basically. And, um, you know, uh, all that, you know, comes down to uh, a lot of commitment in terms of earning income, saving it, investing it well. Um, and obviously, the younger you are, when you begin that process, the better. But, you know, you guys are in the business of trying to help people retire. So I'm curious to get your reaction to that data in general. And maybe just sort of, you know, talk about some of the general strategies that you work with people with, um, especially those who are maybe saying, okay, yeah, I'm entering my my 40s or 50s. I haven't saved up as much as I'd like to yet, but I really need to get going. How can you guys help me? Yeah, Adam, those topics are, are things that we talk a lot about as financial planners. That's a very common conversation. Do I have enough to retire? I'm really worried. And how much is enough? And by the way, people are generally worried no matter how much they have, even if they have mm -hmm. a whole lot more. It's never It never feels like enough because you don't know how much you're going to need. You don't know what inflation is going to be. You don't know how long you're going to live. So you know, I'd warn people that you know, basically just come up with a plan and try to have some um, some tranquility about it. I think it's I think it's more calming to have a plan and, and just kind of continue along once you have a plan and feel less anxiety about it. Yeah, but those numbers are pretty stark, definitely. There's a number of different things that I would talk about, we would talk about with somebody in that type of situation. If somebody was in their in their 50s and had that median number of $57,000, we would ask them a lot of questions about their life, their lifestyle, whether or not they're married, have children, talk about what their real estate investments look like, if they have any, whether they're expecting any inheritances and whatnot. But, and we could run a whole, you know, a full financial plan that would give them some more ease about what their picture would look like. But for most people, social security is going to be a main component of their guaranteed income. Social security is likely to be there. A lot of people are worried that it's going to it's going to go away or it's going to be means tested. If you're in that lower strata there in terms of a, a relatively low income and a relatively low retirement plan balance, even if there is means testing, you're probably not going to be means tested out of it. So I wouldn't worry about that. Secondly, in terms of the social security fund being bankrupt, yes, it's true, but I've got no doubt that the treasury and the fed is going to just print money to back that and i hate to say that because i hate to you know i i i often rail against what the what the fed and our government is doing in terms of you know creating money somewhat fake money you might you might say sometimes but i think that's exactly what they're going to do social security is going to be sacred and i think that's something that you can count on so you know that's the first thing we'll take a look at social security then we'll take a look at your current assets and try to project what they might be down the road and we'll, we, it's pretty easy back at the envelope calculation to calculate what your income is then likely to be. You take your guaranteed sources of income, social security, maybe pensions if you're lucky, plus the future value of your current investments, and then apply some conservative withdrawal rate to that 5%. So in this example, you can pretty much predict what somebody's income is going to be 10 years from now, as long as you don't make any big mistakes with the money and lose it all along the way. But you know, we'll, we'll we'll put that aside for a minute. Even if you just put that money into something guaranteed, you know, five percent over the next ten years, you can pretty much see what their income is going to be. But and so it really comes down to the to the most obvious things: try to earn more money along the way, try to save more money in tax efficient ways, maximize the four hundred one k. If you're a business owner, there's there's pension options and self employed retirement plans that we could talk about where you could put more money in because if you put more money in over five to 10 or 15 years, it could be a big difference. So make more, save more, don't lose it along the way, calculate what social security and other income sources will bring. And then lastly, oftentimes, you know, I've had the pleasure of traveling to different parts of this world. I've visited South America and, and, and other places and I often have talks with people you know, that, that maybe for the first time I introduce ideas I've never heard about before. For instance, consider retiring to a different place in the world. There's many places in the world where you can live on Social Security alone. You know, El Salvador, Colombia, other other Argentina. Um, you know, a number of them happen to be Central and South American countries, and that's not for everybody. 
particularly if you don't know the language and maybe you have kids here that you don't want to leave. But some people have really thought about where can I go that's less expensive than here? Because we have the, the benefit of still the world's reserve currency, a very strong dollar, and there's many places in the world that even if you mess everything else up in your life and you arrive at 65 or 66 with nothing but social security, as long as you're willing to do something uncomfortable, different, you can live in places in this world um, on just a social security payment. Philippines also comes to mind. We've got a number of clients that have done that. Great. Um, I, I love that sense of like, hey, creative thinking, you know, there, there are lots of instruments and strategies just to deploy in the financial world. But then you can say, look, if you think outside of the box, sort of as um, uh, the accountant I've had on the program, Tom Wheelwright, he says, uh, if you want to change your tax, you got to change your facts. Uh, sometimes if you change your facts uh, from a retirement standpoint, you can really change your outlook there. And, and just as a quick nod, uh, my kid's sister lives in Colombia. And uh, it's a phenomenal country. I mean, it's an absolutely wonderful country. Uh, I know most Americans still associate it with uh, the FARC and the cartels down there. Uh, very different world down there than it was, say, back in the 80s and 90s. Um, but it's just one great example of you know, the times I've gone down to visit her. I've been like, oh, my goodness, like, I'd love to retire down here. <laughs> um, all right. Well, one other important thing you said, too, is, is you know, I think a lot of people who aren't confident about their retirement situation. They generally sort of live in a state of, of shock and denial. Like, I don't really want to look in the mirror on this right now because I'm afraid of what I'm going to learn, right? The, and of course, by doing that, you just don't make any progress. Whereas if you put a plan in place, even if you've got some catching up to do, um, getting that plan in place and starting, you know, executing against it, it's just that forward movement, putting one foot in front of the other. And of course, the more you do that, the more uh, you get the, a potential of compounding to start working as a tailwind at your back and all that stuff. So um, folks, you know, if, if, if whether or not you're in that cohort, you know, with the median or even the average uh, amount of retirement savers that we just looked saw in that article, um, there's just no downside to, you know, meeting with your advisor, you know, getting a personal financial plan created, doing the projections out there and saying, okay, great. What other levers can I be pulling here to either bring in the date of my retirement or, to increase my probability that I'm going to hit the retirement by the date that I need to. Um, Adam, Adam, I'd yeah, like to yeah, add a little little um, subtext to Mike talked about. One important thing is is trying not to lose big uh, when you're in the pre or, or post retirement years, and and that that is critical because um, oftentimes folks who feel like they're behind and need to play catch up, they may be. Um, they take more aggressive swings. Tempted, tempted to take more risk uh, because they feel like they need to. And there are simply times in the market where taking more risk doesn't magically give you more upside or return. It, it may, in fact, invite more downside that can be utterly damaging. And it's simple math. And I, you know, I, I'm going to share a picture here because if my verbally saying this, I don't think does the same justice as the picture. And I have to say thank you to some. Um, unknown person on Twitter who, who put this graphic together. It's not, not particularly proprietary or anything like that, but it saved me uh, the work of having to pull one together. But this is the economics of loss, basically. And, and the simple reality is compounding works in both directions. If you suffer uh, losses, the bigger the loss, uh, the, the, the greater the subsequent gain you need to get back to even. So the, the name of the game, obviously, no one likes to lose money. We as investment my, uh, managers hate to see our clients' accounts down even, even a little bit. But the key is if you keep losses pretty small, you can easily come back. You know, 5% loss essentially needs roughly about the same amount to, to get back to even. 10% loss, you need a slightly greater subsequent return to get back to even. But look what happens if you start to suffer some bigger losses. You know, 50% loss, you need a 100% return to get back to even. Simple math, you have $100, you lose 50%, you're at $50, you need to double your money to get back to 100 this is really critical, especially when we're in a phase of the market cycle where, and we can measure this, where valuations are utterly extreme. Um, you know, all the things we've already talked about in this, in this discussion here today. But that's we, we we believe one key role that we can play with folks is to help them be grounded in in their expectations and and to not add insult to injury. Um, simply because they feel like they need to play catch up. There's a time to play catch up, but it's it's when the risks will 
likely or the you know taking the risk will likely be rewarded in a helpful and productive way. Yeah, and that's um I'm so glad you interjected with that. And that was a great chart, by the way, too. Um, but that's exactly where I was going with my last point on this, which is, you know, we just had the interview with Danielle where she talks about a high likelihood of this perfect storm coming, right? So like, you know, back to that article about how, well, the the yield curve, uh, the inverted yield curve hasn't resulted in a recession yet. So maybe it's not, and maybe it's, we're going to have a no landing and it's different this time. That convinces people that it's okay to go out and take on more risk, right? And to your point, John, if they're, if they're compounding that by saying, hey, I'm behind in my savings goals, I'm going to have to take really aggressive risks here. You know, we could be in market conditions right now. That could be the absolute worst time to do that because we may have a really big period of instability coming. You know, Luke Roman, who, like I said, comes to some different conclusions on key assets like bonds from Danielle and you guys. He still thinks, you know, even with that sort of differing of, of, of outcome, he still thinks that we've got a really massive problem ahead of us here. He looks at it through the lens of sort of a, a, a sovereign debt crisis uh, and the commensurate injuries that come along with that. So my point is, is there's just a lot of um, credible you know, data that suggests that we we have a turbulent period lying ahead of us here. And so to your point about, look, if you want to build wealth over time, avoiding the losses really should be a, a higher priority than reaching for gains. You know, we're at a part here where you probably do want to play it relatively safe, given the risks that are out there, at least until they resolve a little bit more and we have a stronger sense of the probabilities. And as we were talking about earlier, we're kind of in this lucky moment where you can sit in safety and get paid a decent return on it. Insurance is still relatively cheap, so you can buy some cheap insurance in your portfolio. Like, There's lots of things that we didn't even have a couple of years ago that can help the cautious, prudent investor right now navigate what's coming. That's kind of the main thing I wanted to underscore. All right, guys, we're gonna have to start wrapping it up here. Um, one quick resource I just wanna mention for folks, uh, Wealthion's uh, online fall conference. Uh, tickets for that just went on sale. The conference itself is going to be Saturday, October 21st. We have an amazing lineup for it, our best lineup yet. We're still adding faculty to it, but here's who we have so far. We've got Lacey Hunt kicking it off with the keynote. We've got James Grant talking about uh, interest rates. Michael Kantrowitz is going to be talking about his HOPE framework with a special focus on employment. Uh, we'll have uh, Ivy Zellman talking about the housing market. We'll have Stephanie Pomboy talking about uh, the forces of inflation and deflation and how they are likely to manifest uh, as we head into 2024. We'll have Kyle Bass talking about the key geopolitical trends that are most likely to impact global markets. Um, we're going to have Mike Leibowitz talking about uh, the outlook for the bond market from here. So a lot more still to come on bonds. Rick Rule, as he did last time, will be sharing his top picks, top stock picks in the natural resources space. Uh, on the energy side, we'll be joined by Doomberg. who will talk about the global energy situation, but then he'll be joined by Justin Hewn. And the two of them are going to dive deep into the opportunities that are being uh, presented today by investing in nuclear energy. Uh, of course, we're going to have our advisors there like John and Mike and Lance uh, Roberts from Real Investment Advice and Jonathan Wellam from uh, Rocklink up there in Canada. Uh, and you'll be able to get their commentary throughout the day, but we're also going to have a, a pretty liberal live Q&A session with them again, too. So you can ask them any questions you want. And again, we still have faculty that we're adding to that list, but you can see this is shaping up to be our best, hardest hitting conference ever. To learn more about it and to sign up, just go to Wealthion.com slash conference. And if you do it now, you'll get the early bird price, which is practically, I think it's, I think it's almost 30% off the full price uh, for tickets. So we want you to get that best price now. Um, secondly, if you are an alumnus of one of our previous conferences, check your email because you'll have gotten a discount code that'll give you an additional 15% discount on top of that 30% uh, early bird price. So again, we wanna make sure that everybody who wants to go can lock in these low prices while they're available. Uh, and wrapping up here, folks, I've mentioned many times the wisdom of working with a professional financial advisor who takes into account all the macro risks that we and folks like Danielle and Luke and some of the other folks who have recently appeared on this channel are flagging. If you've got one who's doing that for you, putting together a personalized portfolio plan and then executing it, executing it for you, great. Stick with them. They are very, very rare. But if you don't have one, or if you'd like a second opinion from one who does, consider scheduling a free consultation with one of the endorsed financial advisors uh, that Wealthion endorses. Uh, to do that, just go fill out the short form at Wealthion.com. Only takes a couple of seconds. Uh, these consultations are totally free. There's no commitment to work with these guys. It's just a free 
public service that they offer to the public to help people position as prudently as possible for a lot of those events that we talked about that might be headed in our future. Um, John and Mike, great as usual. Folks, if you continue to like these, uh, these weekly recaps with the team at New Harbor, please vote your support for that by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Mike, I'm going to let you have the last word here. Any parting bits of advice for folks? Oh, not, not nothing that we haven't already said. I just want to thank everyone for watching. Thank you for what you do, Adam, and all, all the great guests you bring on board. Um, you know, we're, we're, it's a dangerous time. You know, the market's been in rally mode since last October. I believe it's trying to top. Um, there's a lot of mixed signals. Just, you know, just play it safe. Keep it simple. And um, I'll echo what Danielle said, you know, uh, take a break, get on the sidelines with a good part of your assets and uh, enjoy the rest of the summer. All right. Well said. All right. Well, guys, enjoy the rest of your summer. Everybody else, thanks so much for spending this hour with us. We'll see you next time. Thank you, Adam. See you next week, Adam. Thanks. If you'd like to schedule a consultation with one of the financial advisors at New Harbor Financial, simply go to Wealthion.com. These consultations are completely free and there are no strings attached. The good folks at New Harbor will simply answer any questions you have about your investment goals or your portfolio and give you their best advice given their latest market outlook. They're willing to do this because they care about protecting people's wealth and because Wealthion has connected them with so many thoughtful investors just like you over the past decade. We started doing this because so many people have approached us in frustration, looking for a solution because they're feeling out of alignment or downright ridiculed by the standard financial advisors who have been managing their money. You know the type. The kind that just pushes all of your money into the market, scoffs at the idea of owning gold, and when you bring up concerns about the market's sky-high valuations, they say, don't worry, the market will always take care of you. For many of the reasons discussed in today's video, we think this is one of the most challenging and treacherous times in history for investing. We strongly believe that today's investors are best served working in partnership with a conscientious professional financial advisor who understands the risks in play. Now, we're agnostic which professional advisor you work with, as long as they're good. If you're already working with one, that's fantastic. Stick with them. But if you don't, or are having trouble finding one you respect or trust, then consider talking to John and Mike and the team at New Harbor. Now, for those about to ask, yes, there's a business relationship between Wealthion and New Harbor, which we put in place to make sure everything is handled according to SEC regulations. All the details on this are clearly provided on the Wealthion.com website. Also, it's important to note that New Harbor is able to work with U.S. citizens, green card holders, and those with existing assets in the USA. But for regulatory reasons, they aren't able to take on non-U.S. clients. All right. With all that said, if you'd like some insight and guidance on how to protect your wealth during this unprecedented time in the markets, go to Wealthion.com to schedule your free consultation with the good folks at New Harbor. Thanks for watching.